Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another marriage conversation. And uh, Amira, Zaki, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, sister Naima. Thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely wonderful to connect with you again. MashaAllah, we've been privileged to share space many times, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's wonderful for me to see you continue to grow in the work that you do. And in case there's anyone here who does not know the work that you do, will you give them the elevator pitch as to who Amira Zaki is and what is it that she does and who does she help? So I call myself a sex educator, but I never envisaged growing up that this is the work that I would be doing. But I'm grateful that I get to I get to do this work, alhamdulillah. And it all started from my own personal experience of going through a condition called vaginismus, which we will be talking about in today's uh, in today's discussion, inshallah, what vaginismus is. And essentially, it started out with me going through the condition and then overcoming this difficult condition and then helping other women to overcome it. And so I started out really being a vaginismus coach, helping women to overcome this difficult situation. And from that, really seeing that the the cause of vaginismus is such that there's a lack of education with regards to sex and so I kind of broadened my role and decided that actually I need to educate people properly about sex within an Islamic framework mm -hmm. so I, I kind of see that I have two main roles sex educator and vaginismus coach alhamdulillah amazing I love it and subhanallah just as you're saying um, before we jumped on this, I put a post up, didn't I, on Instagram, just to ask people questions, you know, I'm going to be speaking to an expert, do you have any questions about, you know, your first night, your first time, tons of responses, tons and tons of questions, and really, as you say, it points to a lack of knowledge that we, there's this big gap in our knowledge within the Muslim community about sex, mm -hmm. so... I guess my big question to you to kick us off today is what are we not telling what are we not teaching our girls initially we can also talk about boys but what are we not teaching our girls about sex the main thing i feel is that we're not teaching girls muslim girls especially that allah created sex for them to enjoy there is a certain prescription around sex yes like allah has given us certain uh, things that we should follow certain things we should abstain from with regards to sex definitely but unfortunately what we're kind of seeing mostly in the muslim community is that sex is this act that you only do when you're married which is correct but it's only for a man's pleasure um, and it's not something that a woman or a girl is meant to enjoy and I'm here to say that actually that is not what true Islam is telling us and teaching us authentically and traditionally within Islam sex uh, Islam is a very sex positive religion yes there are boundaries yes there are certain rights responsibilities yes there are certain guidelines that we're meant to follow but essentially it is a positive religion when, when it comes to sex and sex was created for girls for women to enjoy you know at the right age when they're mentally and physically ready obviously it was created for male pleasure too but I really want girls to have that foundation of whenever they are of age and they are ready to be married and they get to enjoy this act of sex that it Allah created it for their pleasure and in order to experience that pleasure there does need to be education involved uh, there does need to be debunking of any myths there does need to be a helping a, a girl to understand any fears that she has or any questions that she has and really teaching her about sex and about her body uh, in a way that isn't shameful in a way that doesn't kind of shut shut down her innate curiosity with regards to mm -hmm. sex because I think the majority of people on this planet at some point in their life start to think about sex it's kind of within our fitra to start thinking about sex and our sexuality and about how Allah created our body and we see it all around us like especially if you live in the west we are in this kind of hyper sexualized society whenever you turn on the tv or you know go on the internet there are going to be images and things that you see and I want Muslim girls to understand that you know that is what the media wants you to learn about sex but there is a much better way of learning about sex one that was created specifically for you um, and it can be an enjoyable experience to educate yourself about this one aspect of your life <clears throat> ah! 
<laughs> the internet dropped. Oh my goodness. No worries. That's okay. I'm not okay. sure where I got up to. <laughs> um, okay. Let me pull. So when a girl's inshallah ready to be married, I really want a girl before she reaches, before she reaches marriage, I want her to feel ready for whenever she does have first time sex in that marriage. I don't want her to be going into that marriage dreading her kind of so-called wedding night or dreading her first time experience because what we are still seeing in this day and age is that there are a lot of stories about first time sex specifically with regards to pain if you are a woman that first time sex is meant to be painful and I'm a strong believer that it's not it's not meant to be painful if you have the right education about your body it is very much possible for a, for a female to experience pain-free first-time sex. And that is what I am a big advocate for, is really educating a girl to be mentally and physically ready for that first time. Because what we are seeing in the Muslim community is that if, if, if a Muslim is able to wait until they're married to have sex, which is a difficult thing to do, but if they are able to do it, and may Allah help them to do that, if they are able to do it, typically what we're seeing is that men are looking forward to their first time. Whereas women are kind of feeling the opposite. They're kind of dreading their wedding night or dreading first time sex. And it's unfortunate because of it's those stories and those narratives that we are still teaching our girls that it's meant to be painful. It's just supposed to hurt. Um, whereas actually that's not true. I want girls to be feeling the same way as men. I want, I want women to be feeling the same way as men for their first night. I want them to be thinking, I can't wait to get married. I can't wait to enjoy this experience with my new husband. I want them to be looking forward to it. And that comes from the right education. Uh, and education, I believe, is so important to help us with overcoming those fears that we may have with regards to sex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is great, guys. Um comment below <laughs> what your thoughts are on this mashallah because it is something that obviously if you look at it it makes sense obviously you know we're all grown we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created sex it's pleasurable it, it there's barakah in it you know it's ibadah all of these amazing things but it's almost like we can't get to grips with that in the real world context in a halal way you know we're all used to sex as a kind of smutty thing and like you know like a bit dirty mm -hmm. but not so much as you're saying in this really kind of wholesome way because if a girl did say i am so looking forward to my wedding night you know people would be looking at her like mm, giving her the side eye say mm, especially if she's a virgin yeah. but yeah as you say it is an issue of of um, of education um mm -hmm. and perspective and it's interesting that you mentioned fear because i'm just reading through these questions listen to these questions about the first night so how should the wife prepare for her first time i have lots of questions to ask <laughs> how to start who should make the first move and how how to react if the first move makes me uncomfortable um is intimacy on that night expected what tips would you give on how to discuss intimacy with him uh, is it healthy to have sex on the first night or should i wait does it have to be on the wedding night? Does this have any Islamic value? Uh, I'm, I'm hearing some fear coming through. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing some hesitancy. What should we, what should we be preparing for on our first night anyway? So it's so interesting because what we are still seeing in the Muslim community is that most parents are raising their children um, with this narrative perhaps of we don't talk about sex in this house. Sex is bad, sex is shameful, and don't have sex until you're married. And then there is at the same time, this expectation that when you are married, you're expected to have lots of sex, or you know, if you're a girl, you're kind of expected to give sex to your husband mm -hmm. as if sex is something to give, but that's still the narrative. And so I find it really interesting when you ponder upon that, that you know, you're, not, you're not meant to talk about sex, you're not meant to learn about sex, and then when you're married, you're meant to know you're everything. To know everything. Exactly. Right. You're meant to drop everything and, and have sex immediately on that wedding night. And so mm -hmm. a lot of those questions were, is intimacy expected? In short, the answer is yes, is expected. But really, that isn't the right question. The question should be, Islamically, what does it say about are we kind of meant to have sex on that first night? And the answer is no, you don't have to have sex on that first night, on the actual night of your wedding. You can, if you want to, and if you feel mentally and physically ready, again, that will come from having the right education beforehand. Mm. But if you are newly married and you kind of perhaps got to know your spouse in that kind of traditional way, 
you probably won't feel mentally and physically ready on that actual night. You might want to continue getting to know your new spouse uh, before you feel mentally and physically ready to have first time sex with him or her. So the, in, in terms of uh, sex, it doesn't need to be on the actual wedding night. It can be a few days later, a few weeks later. It could even be a few months later. There is nothing in Islam. There is nothing in you know, the Quran or the authentic Sunnah or Hadith that stipulates that it must happen by a certain day or a certain time. There is no time limit for consummation of the marriage. The marriage is still valid and it really is very dependent on the couple. So some couples might be ready immediately and some will need more time and none of the, like, there is no right or wrong there. It really is. If you st stop and think about the act of sex is a two-way thing. So it doesn't make sense for just one person to be ready because it's going to involve another person. You're not going to have sex on your own. So it doesn't matter if you're ready on your own. It needs to be that the other person is ready too. And really see sex as kind of like teamwork between you and your spouse. If you're ready, but your spouse isn't. So let's say, for example, the man in this context happens to be ready mentally and physically and really wants to have first time sex with his new wife. But the wife in this context isn't ready. She doesn't feel mentally ready or physically ready. The husband should be thinking, what can I do to bring up my wife to my level? I'm physically ready and mentally ready. How can I help her? What fears does she have? What does she want to talk about uh, to help prepare her? What can I do to really support her and bring her there? Because it is teamwork, like marriage is. Marriage is teamwork. And so this one part of your marriage, sex, is going to need to involve teamwork to help both of you be on the same page, inshallah. Sounds like what you're saying is that this education that we need is not just for girls. This is for, for guys as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if that I'm thinking the more that a young man understands about what we're talking about, you know, what, what the role of sex is, you know, um, you know, what sex means for a woman, you know, woman's pleasure, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering whether that will equip him to even have this conversation because I'm just imagining a scenario where a boy doesn't know anything about what we're talking about mm -hmm. and his wife is scared. He wouldn't even have the vocabulary, you know, he wouldn't even have the ability to have a conversation with her about it. I think he would just probably feel very sort of frustrated and rejected and, and not understand, well, why doesn't she want me? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And this comes again from education. I feel like um when you asked me what do girls need to know I forgot to say that really girls need to educate themselves about their bodies and about sex and about the desire for sex and how to manage their desire for sex if you know that they're, they're, they've made the decision that I want to follow Allah's prescription for sex and I want to wait until I'm married to have sex for the first time how do I manage my natural desire for sex that I may have before I'm married how do I manage that in a healthy halal way that also applies to, to boys as well and to men as well that they need to educate themselves about their own bodies they need to educate themselves about how to manage their desire for sex before they're married and they also need to educate themselves about the experience of the opposite sex of their future wife so you don't just need to learn about things uh, from the lens of your own gender you can also learn about things from the opposite gender too and that also applies to girls girls can need to understand the male sexual anatomy the male sexual response or desire for sex um, and know that there are different types of desire, and this applies to, to males and females. The, the two main types of desire, they're known as spontaneous desire and responsive desire. Mm. Most people are familiar with spontaneous desire. They may not know it has that term, but I'll briefly explain what it is. Spontaneous desire typically happens when you have that kind of feeling of initial attraction, perhaps towards someone, or maybe something you see, an image you see, and you feel a desire. You maybe feel a physical response within your body, and you know that you are perhaps sexually turned on or sexually aroused, and you desire to be intimate sexually with someone. That is spontaneous desire. It kind of happens immediately, spontaneously. The other type of desire is known as responsive desire, where it's very dependent on the context a person is in. Both types of desire, spontaneous and responsive, can apply to men and women. With responsive desire, it's not from an initial spark or initial attraction to someone. It's someone feeling safe, feeling comfortable, feeling relaxed, uh, having the right environment physically around them, but also being in the right mental and emotional environment when all those things are in place they then respond positively to those different stimuli and then they start to feel sexually aroused and desire sex. So uh, both girls and boys need to know that because typically what's, what, what we're noticing is that 
females tend to experience more responsive desire and men tend to experience more spontaneous desire but it is possible for women to have spontaneous and it is possible for for men to experience responsive so it is definitely uh, fluid and dynamic but I, I feel like if boys especially and men especially understand that that oh my future wife may experience more responsive desire she may not have the same desire where you know when i look at my wife i'm instantly attracted and want to have sex on the spot she may not feel that way and if she does experience more responsive desire what can i do as the husband to give her the right stimuli the right environment physically the right environment mentally and emotionally to help her become sexually turned on um, so that is definitely really important um, and sex education is gender neutral we need to be teaching our boys about it our young men about it just like we need to be teaching our girls and young women about it mashallah amazing so we've talked about the kind of you know maybe jitters wedding night nerves you know just just the shyness those types of things that could potentially lead uh, someone to to not feel ready um, on their on their on their first time um, but some couples really struggle um, on their first time don't they um, mm -hmm. it's not so much that they don't want to it's that they can't mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about that that situation yeah so this situation that you're describing is a lot more common than people imagine um, i'll give you a kind of story from my own personal experience I, as I mentioned, I went through something called vaginismus, which I'll talk about in a moment, but I basically wasn't able to consummate my marriage or have sex for the first time on my wedding night. So I was kind of raised to, I, I waited until I got married, alhamdulillah, to try and experience first time sex with my new husband. And on that wedding night, we tried to have sex and it was very difficult and very painful. And actually in the lead up to my wedding night, I remember, so before I was married, I remember thinking, oh my God, in a few months time, I'm going to be married. And uh, I remember hearing stories when I was a teenager that first time sex for a girl or first time sex for a woman is going to be really painful. There may even be blood involved. Um, and so I naturally started to feel really nervous and worried and scared actually for first time sex, worried that, oh my God, I'm going to have to go through pain. The majority of humans never want to experience pain. And I felt really scared. So here I was newly married trying to have sex for the first time. And it was exactly like those stories had told me. It was really painful, so much so that, and I'm gonna use words that we need to become more comfortable with. I'm gonna use words like penis and vagina, so much so that my husband's penis wasn't able to go inside my vagina because of how painful it was. And at first I didn't understand why, I didn't know what was going on in my body. And I kind of just thought, okay, everyone warned me about this. Everyone told me that it's kind of meant to hurt. And so I accepted it. And then because it was so painful, I said to my husband, look, we can't go any further, let's stop. And my husband was understanding, he kind of put it down to first time nerves and we did stop and we said, we'll try again another day. So we waited a little while and we tried again and the same thing happened, but this time it felt so much worse because my brain was remembering that first experience of pain. And so I didn't notice, but my whole body was tensing up. My legs started to shake. And when we did try again, the same thing happened. We weren't able to have sex again. And this continued for weeks and months. And it started to put a really big strain on our marriage. And again, we were clueless. We didn't know why this was happening. We didn't know how to help ourselves. My husband didn't really understand what was going on. Um, it continued to put that strain on our marriage emotionally and mentally and even spiritually. And it kind of a year went by and my husband and I ended up having a conversation where he essentially said to me, look, Amira, I don't really know how to help you. I don't know how to help you overcome your fear. I don't know how to make it less painful. I don't know how to make it less painful for you, but I don't know how long we're going to continue living like this. And if we live like this for many more months and many years, we're probably going to end up getting divorced from this. And he didn't say it in a threatening way. He just kind of said it in this realistic way where he was doing everything he caught he did. He was supporting me. He was being patient, but he literally didn't know what else to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so after that, I had to make the decision myself that I need to find a way to treat myself. I need to find a way to overcome this. And I felt too embarrassed and ashamed to go and, you know, seek medical help. Um, and the reason for that is 
I knew that if I went to see my doctor, they may want to kind of check me physically down there. And I felt too scared about that. So I was like, okay, let me go on the internet. Let me try and treat myself. And so I started searching online for solutions to painful sex. And through that research, I came across the term vaginismus. When I read about what vaginismus was, I, it was like a light bulb moment. I felt this huge sense of relief that, oh my God, finally, I'm, I understand what I'm going through now, that there's a medical term for this condition that I'm going through. And it immediately made me feel less alone because up until that point, I felt like I was abnormal. I felt like I was the only woman who can't have sex on this planet. That's how I felt. And I read about vaginismus and I, uh, and essentially, let me talk about what it is now. Vaginismus is a condition in which a woman's pelvic floor muscles so the pelvic floor muscles are the muscles that surround your vagina. So in vaginismus, the pelvic floor muscles contract automatically, invol involuntarily. Mm -hmm. um, and when those pelvic floor muscles contract, it makes the vagina really narrow. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that was happening to me until I read about vaginismus. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine if the vagina is becoming narrow, now if something's trying to go in, such as during penetrative sex, it's going to be painful and difficult. There's going to be that friction due to the narrowing of the vagina from those pelvic floor muscles contracting. Mm -hmm. So this is what was happening to me. I was experiencing vaginismus and it felt good to know that it had a name to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking, okay, if this is what I'm going through, surely there must be a way to treat it. There must be a way to overcome it. And that really came from starting the journey of educating myself about sex I didn't realize that was like what that was what I was doing but that's really where my journey towards sex education for myself started is I had to educate myself about my own body about my female sexual anatomy I had to educate myself about how do I now get these muscles to relax if the issue is that they're contracting on their own how do I consciously get them to be relaxed so that my vagina is nice and wide and open for pain-free penetration and so I took that journey I eventually was able to overcome it I was eventually able to have pain-free sex with my husband truly for the first time hmm. so I'm saying how that long, because how long after was that how long after it, so panel, it literally took me about four or five weeks to overcome oh, okay. it which is a short amount of time for most women it's it takes a bit longer but for me it was like it just was like that. I don't know how to describe it. It was like the initial education. Uh, so actually I say four or five, five weeks, but maybe it was longer actually. It was four or five weeks once I bought myself a set of tools. They're known as dilators. They're essentially like tampons, but they come from like really small sizes and then they kind of gradually increase. It was from the moment I ordered those dilators and received the dilators and started using them. From then it's when it took me four to five weeks. Okay. Uh, and but how long yeah. after your marriage was that? So how many? That years? was more than a year later, more than a year. So at least a year and a half after my marriage. Um, so I was then I, I treated myself uh, and that treatment wasn't just physical treatment using the dilators. That was one part of it. But it was also, you know, I didn't realize I was doing this, but I was also uh, healing myself mentally from those fears uh, and those myths that I believed about sex. And I was then able to finally have true first time sex in a completely pain free way. And why I say true first time is because the previous times when I tried to have first time sex, when they were painful, I don't see it as my true first time. I saw it as kind of like something that I wasn't meant to experience. I wasn't meant to experience painful first time sex, but I did. And it was painful because of the lack of education. And so once I had the right education and I treated myself and my husband's penis was finally able to fully go in my vagina and I saw for myself, wow, there is no pain. I take that as my true first time. And that is what I want for every single woman is to, if they're not married, to go into a marriage with the right education about her body, knowing how to relax her pelvic floor muscles and experience true pain-free first time sex. And um, when I eventually told my family about it, and so I didn't tell them initially, I told them many years later, I told my siblings initially before my parents, when I told them, um, and I remember I was, I was telling them because it was one of my younger sisters, she was about to be married. And for some reason, one of them asked me, what was your first time like? And I said to one of my siblings, 
I couldn't have sex on my wedding night and they were shocked they were like what like what do you mean you couldn't have sex and I was like it was too <laughs> painful no, idea. no exactly <laughs> no idea. I, I said look it just it couldn't happen it was too painful and, and I went through this condition called vaginismus and I explained it to them and they were surprised and actually they were shocked they were like why didn't you tell us we would have you know helped you all of that yeah, kind of stuff I would have like, been shocked too yeah exactly like, and, half and, of, not, of not, nothing just, just <laughs> pretending like everything is yep everything's fine everything's normal yeah your mom never asked you your aunties never asked you no. after the fact how was it are you okay or anything no. like that no they didn't yeah no they didn't and I and I don't blame them for that my mum was raised you know she grew up in Thailand and you know I, I suppose even in Thailand she wasn't raised Muslim but she is now alhamdulillah mm. even in Thailand I don't think it's a topic that you discuss you know talking about sex and, and the same with my dad he grew up in Egypt you know he never spoke to me about it no, at your all. Dad's not going to ask you that's no that's exactly, exactly. so <laughs> no neither of my parents or family members or anyone asked me initially I think they just assumed that it would all be fine they I think they just assumed that I was no longer a virgin. I think that was right. the assumption that they made, but they didn't ask me how it was. Um, mm. But yeah, no, alhamdulillah. And so I think what the point I was trying to make through sharing this whole story is that there is this, there is so much expectation on Muslim couples to do it on their first night, to have sex yeah. for the first time on that night. Mm. And of course you can, it's now halal for you to have sex, but only do it, only have, only only engage in your first sexual experience with your new spouse if both of you are ready mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And if one or both of you are not, work together. You're now in this marriage, you're now a team. Work together to raise each other up, to get to that same point where you're both on the same page, because that is going to be a much more pleasant, pleasurable, enjoyable, intimate experience. Uh, when you do engage in it and it will be so much more worth it inshallah rather than going through the frustration uh, and disappointment of your first time because of the lack of education and the lack of teamwork it's bring each other to the same page but on that note what I do want to say is I, I, I feel like sex is a skill and initially your first few times when you have sex it may not be what you imagine it may not feel the way you expect you may not experience this amazing kind of mind-blowing pleasure you may not experience orgasm and all of that is normal it's going to require you to take time to you know tune into your body know what works for your body work together with your spouse uh play with each other have fun with each other's bodies you now get to be intimate in this way uh that you can't be intimate in that way with anyone else so just mm -hmm. take your time with it it doesn't have to be perfect sex is not a performance uh sex is really this experience and it really is a spiritual experience now that you're married because when you are engaging in sexual intimacy with your spouse you are being rewarded for it even if you know the act of sex doesn't happen if you are being sexual with some with your spouse you are being rewarded for that if you are thinking about how can i give like how can i make this more pleasurable for my spouse how can i also how can I also receive pleasure and being willing to receive pleasure? And I think this applies a lot more to women than men, but it can be both ways, is seeing sex as this act between two people, but also seeing sex as a giving and receiving, which I think is the essence of marriage, is being able to give as much as receive. And that definitely applies to, to, to sex, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, I remember um, uh, last time we had uh, a conference and I, if I remember correctly, it was it was in that talk that you talked about a woman's responsibility in that sexual relationship to understand herself and understand her. I remember you, you were talking about, you know, understanding what gets you to that place and taking responsibility for that. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was saying that I, I really believe that it's a woman's responsibility to prioritize her orgasm. Um, but actually, more than that, it's really prioritized pleasure. Um, I think a lot of Muslim women have been raised to believe that sex isn't something that was meant created for them. It was created for a man's orgasm or male pleasure. And it's not necessary for you as the woman to experience pleasure and it doesn't matter if you as the woman don't experience orgasm. None of that comes from Islam. Islam teaches us that Allah created sex for both male and female pleasure. If you dive into authentic sources, dive into 
what the Quran and the Sunnah and the Hadith say about pleasure, it's really that pleasure was created for both the man and the woman. And so when you understand that as a woman, it's important to prioritize that and remember that Allah created sex for your pleasure as a woman. And so if Allah created sex for your pleasure as a woman, you need to go and seek it. You need to go and seek it out. So I remember when you delivered a talk and you were talking about a woman's responsibility for her own kind of her own sexual state and her part in that sexual relationship uh, and how, you know, her being aware of what turns her on, uh, of what gets her to that place, what gets her in the mood allows her, it actually empowers her to feel sexual without the need for, for example, her husband to necessarily perform X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, you know, I, I, firstly for me, it really, it kind of made so much sense because so many of us as women, obviously we complain about not being in the mood, right? Um, and like, it's like, he always wants it, but it's like, I'm not in the mood because mm -hmm. it's all up here. And mm -hmm. when you said, taking responsibility for your own part that you play in that dance, it made so much sense to me. And I think if, if more women understood what that means and were able to kind of leverage their ability to get themselves to that place, I think maybe we would avoid a lot of the kind of mismatch in sexual desire between men and women. But just explain what you meant by that sort of a woman taking responsibility for her own kind of her, the, the role she plays in the sexual relationship. Yeah, so what we're seeing, obviously, is that most um, most men, regardless of religion, really, most men have kind of been programmed that sex was created for them and their pleasure. If you're programmed that way, it's a belief that you have. So imagine that you're a man and you're programmed that when you have sex, it's meant to be pleasurable for you. You're meant to ejaculate an orgasm and it's meant to feel really good. Mm -hmm. And so men believe that, oh, wow, sex was created for me. I meant to experience pleasure. I meant to orgasm and it's meant to feel really good. This so they, really great. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, they go into, so men go into a sexual experience with their wives, expecting it to feel good. And they will do whatever they need to do with their wife, whatever stimulation they need to receive from their wife. They will, they will expect it, but not necessarily demand it. You know, most husbands are good. They won't demand it, but they will have that expectation. Mm -hmm. And they usually will communicate with their wife before or during, uh, or, you know, move their body in a certain way to bring themselves to pleasure and lead mm -hmm. them to orgasm mm -hmm. because they have the belief. Women, on the other hand, girls, on the other hand, have not been taught that, have not been taught that sex was created for them, that mm -hmm. sex is meant to be pleasurable for you um, and that you're meant to orgasm. But what's important for women is to start believing that sex was created by Allah for your pleasure. So start programming yourself, just like men were programmed by society. Society did the opposite to females, but we need to um, uh, we need to debunk that mm -hmm. and go back to the true source and say, okay, Allah created sex for me. And if you want the evidence, go and do your research. There is evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah, the fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enjoyed sexual pleasure with his wives, but equally his wives experience pleasure with their husband, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you as a woman need to emulate that. We are, you know, all, as 
as Muslims, we are all trying to emulate the Prophet. And it's not just the fact that he was a man and thinking, yes, he was meant to experience pleasure, but his wives also experienced pleasure. So we as women need to be emulating that. They are our role models. So start with the belief that Allah created sex for me. If I'm a woman, I need to believe Allah created sex for me. Allah created sex for me to experience pleasure. Allah created sex for me to experience orgasm if I'm able to. When you start with that, you then will start thinking, okay, what is it that I need to know? What does it need to know about my body or any kind of bits of education with regards to sex? What is it that will help me experience that pleasure that Allah created for me? It is very much possible. You need to believe that it can be your reality to experience pleasure, but there may be certain things that you don't know about your body. So go on that journey of educating yourself about your body and being willing to experiment with your husband with regards to finding what works for you and your unique self and, and unique body. And in terms of prioritizing pleasure, I really believe that if more women prioritize pleasure, prioritize their orgasm in the context of sex with their husband, they will enjoy sex more. They will not see sex as a chore because sex is not meant to be a chore. They will finally experience amazing an amazing sex life with their husband and they will naturally start to desire it more. Just like if you eat a really delicious cake, uh, you will desire that cake more. You will crave that cake more. The same applies to sex. If you experience really pleasurable sex with your spouse, you will naturally want to experience that more and more. So prioritize your orgasm, prioritize pleasure. And I really feel like it will make such a difference to your marriage because sex is a big part of marriage. Your sexuality is a big part of marriage. Obviously it's not the only thing, but it is a big thing. And I find that when there are issues sexually within the marriage, it can usually have negative knock on effects to other areas of your marriage. Yeah. And so really like not kind of, I, I think a lot of women tend to see sex as this thing that's not very important. And I will kind of just have sex with my husband whenever he wants it. And it's not that important, but actually sex is a big foundation in your marriage. And so start seeing it as something that I need to prioritize. And one thing that will help women prioritize it more is remembering and reminding yourself that sex in your marriage is an act of worship. We are rewarded when we do any act of worship, praying, reading Quran, fasting, giving charity. Sex is equally an act of worship. So it is very important to educate yourself about it, prioritize it, and know that you are being rewarded. And I have found that when I went from that place and understood that, it really helped my connection with Allah, subhanahu, subhanAllah, because when I was able to experience more pleasure and orgasm in my marriage, I felt kind of in awe of Allah's generosity, that Allah wants me to feel this good and he's rewarding me for it in this life and the next. That's, that's amazing. Like really when you think, of, yeah, exactly. So I, I think that that's the message I want women to start uh, programming themselves with is sex was created for me as a woman and I'm going to do whatever it takes to find out how to make sex pleasurable and orgasm. And I'm going to communicate with my husband and we're going to work as a team. And inshallah, just watch how many positive effects it has in your marriage. Mm. I absolutely love that. And I think if I remember correctly, we talked about uh, before about two different kinds of, um, of desire, uh, spontaneous desire and responsive, responsive. desire. Yeah. So, for example, if a woman knows that she's more inclined to the responsive desire and, for example, she needs to smell nice in order for her to feel in the mood, mm -hmm. right? Or she needs to be clean because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or, or she needs the lights low or she mm -hmm. needs certain smells. Yeah. Um, I remember you saying, do it then. Mm -hmm. Like, make that happen, you know. And, and, this, and this is what, for me, what was really empowering about it was again, we, we have this narrative that men always want it mm -hmm. and sorry, husbands always want it and wives are always trying to put it off. Mm. You know, the whole, I've got a headache trope. It's mm -hmm. been a long day. Mm -hmm. You know, if maybe if you help me with the kids more, you know, maybe if you did the dishes more, basically I don't want this with you. Right. And it's, it's, it, oh, 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 the Muslim version. I'm going to have to make hustle. <laughs> I just got my hair done, you know, like these types of things, right? Yeah. So there's this, this narrative that husbands want it and wives are trying to put it off. Um, and when I heard you talking about, you know, firstly, I mean, from where I'm sitting and what I came to understand was that we know that Islamically, 
the husband and the wife have the right to enjoy each other. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of the, the, the one of the foundations of the nikah. You mm-hmm. become halal for each other. Mm-hmm. You both have sexual rights, which means that you both have sexual responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, taking it from the woman's side, from the wife's side, and I know it's not a very sexy way of saying it, and it's not very fashionable, but the reality is that you have a responsibility because he has a right. Therefore, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility as a wife to take care of him in that way. Now, of course, people don't want to hear that because we've, we've got this idea that sex should be the spontaneous thing and that desire should be this big passionate wave that kind of pushes you forward. And if you don't have that, then you're not in the mood and you shouldn't have to do anything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and kind of what I've learned along the way is that when you understand that, okay, I want my husband to, 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 to fulfill himself in a halal way with me, Mm -hmm. therefore I have a part to play what is that part Mm -hmm. is it changing my mindset around sex is it looking at how my timetable or my list of activities is impacting our sex life is it as you say taking control of the factors I can control and getting myself into that mood so that it's a very small bridge between us you know what I mean rather than putting all the heavy lifting on him Mm -hmm. and Say, well, show me something then. Like, okay, you want it? All right, then make it happen, you know? And there's kind of this this combative kind of like, well, you know, I don't want to, but yeah, okay, fine, if we have to, you know, type of thing. I mean, what what do you think about that? I love that you said that. And I want to say one tip that will, inshallah, change, you know, if if there's a woman here listening to this and she's feeling everything you just said, there's one thing that will really help and it's going to sound not very sexy, but it is going to inshallah make a difference. And that is to schedule sex. Ah, yes. And it it sounds like, whoa, you're telling me to schedule sex. Isn't sex meant to be spontaneous? No. It's to be. Exactly. Uh, It's this whole thing about the spontaneous design. Exactly. I mean, I mean, says who? Says who? Who says it's meant to be spontaneous? Did Allah say that? (laughs) No. Allah never said that you can't have sex if you schedule it. Where's your delil? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So I'm saying schedule sex because when we, whenever you have something important, there is, you, you, there's a time for it. You know, when that appointment is going to be, and you usually will put it in your calendar or diary if you have one, or you'll just know that, okay, this is the time that I'm meant to be doing this appointment, this priority. So do the same with sex, schedule it whether physically putting it on your calendar or diary or, and you know, you don't have to label it as sex, but it could just be time with my husband. You could just label it that something, you know, something that you don't care if someone else were to see that Um, and making it a regular thing that you do, obviously, you know, if you can't do it for whatever reason, you know, you were ill or you're on your period, whatever it is fine, but you kind of have a general regular schedule for when you have sex and why this works for a lot of women is because as I mentioned earlier, most women experience responsive desire. So they need the right context, they need to feel safe, comfortable, they need to feel ready mentally, physically, they need to um, be in the right context environmentally, like the right surroundings, but also feel mentally and emotionally in the right context. When you schedule it and you know that, okay, I'm gonna be having sex and intimate time with my husband Saturday at 9 p.m on a regular schedule. And you can start there, start with like once a week, for example, except when you're on your period, you just don't have to do it that day. Um, If you know that, you know that, okay, I'm gonna be enjoying this, this, I'm gonna be having this time with my husband, and I wanna make the most of that time. I want to make sure it's pleasurable for me. What do I, as a woman, need to do in the days leading up to that, uh, you know, Saturday at 9 p.m.? What do I, as a woman, need to prepare? What can I, uh communicate with my husband with regards to if you know if I have kids how can he perhaps do bedtime that day so I can go and have a nice bath or go for a walk or read a book or just have me time whatever it is um so do engaging in in self-care time before sex is really important for a woman having time to herself before enjoying time with her husband Mm -hmm. but equally changing your mindset to see that sex uh is not a chore and um sex is meant to be for your pleasure too and sex is also meant to be your self-care time with your husband speak on that sis say (laughs) that again yes Mm -hmm. yes if if you think about whenever we talk about self-care we talk about things that are good for us Mm -hmm. things that are healing for us things that make Mm -hmm. us feel good things that are pleasurable for us 
we tend to hear the things of like having a facial massage, all of those things are fine. All of those things can inc be incorporated in self-care. But the main, the, the essence of self-care, something that is self-care is something that's good for you, something that will help you, something that is good for you spiritually, emotionally, mentally. All of those things can occur when you are engaging in sex with your husband. It can feel good, physically good, mentally yes. good, spiritually good. It can heal you. There is a lot of energy exchange when, when you engage in sex. So sex with your husband is self-care. There are so many things that we can do for self-care, like that involve other people, such mm -hmm. as, you know, to get a massage, it needs another person to typically massage you unless you're kind of self-massaging or, you know, going out for a coffee with friends. That is, you know, your self-care time, but with other people, there's mm -hmm. self-care that you do on your own and self-care that you do with others. Mm -hmm. Sex is a self-care act that you do with someone else, with your spouse. So not seeing sex as this chore, this thing that I just have to give, it's something that you are going to enjoy and something that you can uh, look forward to so even though you're scheduling it it doesn't mean it's a chore you're scheduling it because like it's a priority time. exactly yeah. it's your me time you're scheduling it because it's a priority you're scheduling it because your marriage is a priority you're scheduling it because you are a priority it's uh, you're scheduling it because it's an act of worship like just like there are certain times for prayer the same applies to sex there might be a certain time where you naturally feel like okay that is the time when I will feel most ready to have sex mm -hmm. is in the evening once my kids are asleep but are, like really um looking at the roles within your marriage like if you are taking on most of the roles with regards to chores in the house or raising up the kids and that is draining you you know physically and mentally and emotionally is 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 realizing that it doesn't have to be all on you as the woman to do all those things it's communicating with your husband saying I would like you to do these things you know at certain times and, and being a team and uh you know having that conversation where he takes on some of that load to some of that burden that you may feel um, because it's going to work in your favor, but equally it's going to work in his. If he's doing those things and you're having sex more frequently, let's say it is once a week because you're scheduling it once a week. I'm sure that once a week is a lot more frequent than you're currently having it. Like right now you might just be like doing it once a month or once every two months because that's what I'm hearing from my clients is really? like putting it off as much as possible and then doing it once a month because they're like oh it's been quite a while but once a week or three times a month because on you know one of the weeks you might be on your period three times a month is for a lot of people listening to this that is already more frequent wow. than you're currently doing it and if it isn't like let's say three weeks a week three 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 times a, uh, a month isn't regular enough for your spouse and you schedule it to be twice a week instead then really putting it in your calendar and again the same thing applies is how can I get myself ready for that moment what conversations do I need to be having with my spouse so that I feel really ready really looking forward to it and what conversations I think you know just to jumping off what you're saying what conversations should I be having with myself mm -hmm what's going on in here yeah. in order for me to see that as self-care and i really i love that we're gonna definitely guys you need to just do something with that <laughs> a meme a tweet a <laughs> post on instagram something because you know intimate time with hubby ticks all the boxes of self-care just as you mentioned yeah. and it's so crazy <clears throat> that it's like sex outside of marriage is this wild exciting ride right mm. it's everywhere you you look mm -hmm. right it's in every film it's in every tv series it's in every song it's in every billboard it's literally yeah. with our society is saturated with sex right yeah most of it outside marriage let's be frank okay most of it is haram that's out there yeah when it comes to marriage it's like a sex desert mm. it's like married people do not do that it, that's that's <laughs> kind of the message that we get from society because sex is so very rarely spoken about in the context of a marriage mm -hmm. uh, and when we're talking about marriages we're very rarely talking about sex you know mm -hmm. so for us to embrace the idea as muslims and as people who you know who are married let's let's you know let's just call it what it is that this is the playground this is the space this yeah. is the space this is this is the place to explore this is the place to, you know, to, to be playful, to be experimental, to, to connect, to be intimate, you know, this should be where the focus is, not all that stuff out there. Yeah. Um, and, and really, as you say, in that investment in yourself, 
all the physical, the emotional, the, the health benefits, all of that. And then the investment in the relationship between you and your husband. Um, because, you know, I know we're, we're not really, you know, talking about this today, but this this whole thing of sort of the dead bedroom or sexless marriages, or like you say, you know, people who, you know, would be grateful for once a month, you know, or twice a month. And, you know, and, and they can't see themselves getting more than that. I, I often think about say whichever side it is whether it's the husband or the wife that wants more and is being pushed away continually pushed away um i've I've always thought about this scenario and i've kind of tried to reverse the roles so say you know you are my spouse or you ask your spouse for a piece of cake they have the cake in their hand and you're hungry and you ask them for the piece of cake and they say no Mm -hmm. And the next time you see them, you say you're hungry, they have the cake in their hand, and they say no. Mm -hmm. And just the the sense of, you know, what we talked about earlier, the, the rejection. Uh, and the and I think I've heard, I've listened to quite a few, you know, talks about this, the sense of loneliness mm -hmm. and, and isolation that you feel in a marriage, especially, you know, as a Muslim, where this is where it's all supposed to go down, right? This is where it's supposed to happen. All the things you said, it's halal, it's ibadah, it's all of these things. And your spouse doesn't want you like that. And yeah. your spouse can't bring themselves to desire you in that way. Yeah. For those of us who are on the side of pushing away, I'm saying this for you really, because I, I would love for you to examine what's really going on, you know, and, and have you thought of what it would feel like if the shoe was on the other foot? So true. And, 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 and can you, you know, can you get yourself to a place where that's not the dynamic in your relationship? Because I just, I feel it's so sad. Mm -hmm. It's such a sad place to be, you know, where you're with okay. someone, you may love them and everything, but they don't want you. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What I want to say to that is I, I really think it's important to help with what you've just said. I think it's important um, because what you've said is usually the woman experiencing that where like her husband wants sex a lot and she perhaps doesn't and she keeps on kind of turning down her husband and then the husband feeling uh kind of disconnected having said that it's not always the case it can it's definitely always be the, the case other. Yeah, it can yeah. always be the other way so regardless of of who it applies to i think it's important to expand your definition of sex and sexual activity uh, i found with the women that i work with that they feel very limited to this idea that sex is meant to be a certain way and there's only kind of one type of sex, mm -hmm. i.e. sex is sexual intercourse or sex right. is, is penetration. Sure. And they feel like it's very limiting because sometimes they're just not in the mood for penetration, but mm -hmm. they would be happy for other forms of sex. They would be happy to, they would be happy, for example, if they're not in the mood and they're not fussed about their own pleasure at that moment in time, they don't really care to experience orgasm right there. Mm -hmm. Um, but their husband really does, or the spouse really does, whichever way it is, um, they might still feel willing to provide that to their spouse and, 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 you know, give pleasure to their spouse without receiving anything. And that's a great thing. If they are happy to do that, yeah. perfect. But they feel like limited by that one type of sex because they just feel like perhaps penetrative sex is a bit uncomfortable or it, they're approaching their time of the month and they're feeling a bit of pain and discomfort down there and they're just like I'm really not in the mood for that or they've had a busy day with the kids or work or whatever and they're like they feel like that they feel like the reason they have to say no to their spouse is because of that one type of sex that they feel like is the only that or nothing else. If that's the offer, then it's that, no from exactly. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes penetrative sex just feels too much. Like it requires quite a lot of energy. And for women, especially in order to have penetrative sex, it's not just this physical act of the man's penis going in the vagina. So many things need to happen before that, uh, you know, a lot of foreplay needs to happen for it to feel pleasant and comfortable and enjoyable for yeah, her. Yeah. And so if a woman in this context, uh, is limited to that one definition of sex naturally she's probably going to want to turn down her husband because she's just thinking it's too much hassle it's too much pain and discomfort if you expand your definition of sex and sexual activity and this i think is important for men because a lot of men also limit themselves mm -hmm. and kind of think i'm now married and whenever i want sex it's meant to be a certain way it's meant to be that my penis has to go in my wife's mm -hmm. vagina um 
And of course, that is pleasurable. Yeah. One time. (laughs) Yeah. And of course, it is pleasurable for for men to, uh, you know, for for a man's penis to go in the vagina. But that is not the only way that a man orgasms. It's not just from penetrative sex. There are so many different positions and types of sex Mm -hmm. that are allowed islamically manual stimulation with your hands you can even use your mouth a lot of scholars say that oral sex is permissible essentially when it comes to sex islamically the only thing that is not allowed that is not permitted is anal sex Mm -hmm. and penetrative sex when a woman's on her period so when you kind of Mm. you know when you kind of think okay those are the only things that are not allowed there's so much else so many other things on the menu that you can choose from and so out here. Exactly, exactly and if, if, if penetrative of sex is like number one on the menu mm. you know but you can't have that for whatever reason what's next what are the other things that you both enjoy that the woman or the not the woman that one spouse is happy to do and the other spouse is happy to receive that kind of thing and then that should hopefully bring you to a place where you're able to both have frequent sex sex doesn't always have to be about giving and receiving pleasure <clears throat> it can sometimes be just about the giving whether that's okay. the man focusing just on the woman's pleasure or the woman okay. focusing just on the man's pleasure, as long as they're happy to do that. But it shouldn't become this thing where it's always one-sided, but sometimes it absolutely can be. Yeah. So that's relevant to what you said, where you were talking about rights and also responsibilities, where if one spouse keeps feeling like they're saying no to their spouse, but they're also understanding that, oh, okay, this is my responsibility and Allah, I'm, I'm accountable for my actions and that I don't want my spouse to be feeling lonely and disconnected. Mm-hmm. Um, and my spouse is, you know, craving sex and wanting sex and wanting that connection with me. How can I still provide that to my spouse, but in a way where I'm not fully sacrificing myself all the time? Yeah, it is I love that. I, I love that. And another thing that kind of occurred to me in this space as well. Uh, that occurred to me in, in this space as well is again a mindset thing um, about desire and I wonder whether we as women as wives let's make it specific whether we as wives almost take for granted the fact that our husband will desire us um, mm-hmm. so much so that it's like he's always you know he's just ugh, yeah that kind of dismissive attitude or even just like you feel put upon Mm. Um, and I get it, you know, again, going back to what we were saying before the chores are this or that everything, life in general, just, you know, pushing that way off the list of priorities, but I, I, I found it useful to reframe husband's desire, my husband's desire for me. It's a privilege really for me. Yes, it is. it's, it's an honor Yeah, because it doesn't have to be that way. He doesn't have to desire me. Yeah, he could desire anyone. He yeah. could desire anyone. There are men who desire many other women, and yeah. you know there are men out there who fulfill their desires with other women, right? Mm-hmm. So if my husband f- desires me in the state that I'm in, whatever that state is, mm-hmm. because of course you know we also have issues about our bodies, and if we put on weight, and if we've had the baby, and all of these things, and we're measuring ourselves up to whatever we've seen on social media or whatever we've seen on TV, right? And we don't feel attractive. And yet your mm-hmm. husband still desires you though, sis. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So maybe you need to stop taking your cues from Instagram and respond to him because this is the man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in your life yeah. as your source of intimate pleasure. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he wants you it's not a burden, sis. It's not a burden. The fact that he wants you is fantastic yeah. because it, you know, he doesn't have to, you know, there are, cu- there are couples where the husband doesn't want his wife. He's not attracted yeah, to her. Okay. He's not turned on by her. He does not want to have relations with her. I would prefer to take a man who desires me yeah. over someone who couldn't care less. But 100%. again, it's a, it's a mindset shift, isn't it? I love that you said that because actually I think m- the majority of women actually want to be desired. Of course we do. The majority of, of women want to feel attractive, want to feel beautiful, want to feel sexy. And so here you are in this marriage where all of those are happening for you. Your husband mm. finds you attractive and desires you sexually and wants to connect with you intimately. Mm-hmm. Um, but you are, like you said, kind of taking it for granted or dismissing it or not seeing it as a big deal. But it is a big deal. It is a big deal that he desires you and wants to be with you. What's important 
is that women start desiring themselves because I feel mm, <laughs> now she's going deep okay girl give it to us yes yeah I, I feel that like you said women are on Instagram comparing themselves to other women and what other women look like and thinking that I don't understand why does my husband desire me when you know I have a flabby belly and stretch marks and big thighs or whatever yep. saggy breasts and you know he could he could go and desire that other woman on Instagram and like you said there are men who do desire other women outside the marriage but here you are blessed to be in this marriage where your husband only has eyes for you and truly desires you regardless of what you look like externally because at the end of the day your level of sexual pleasure in your marriage doesn't depend on what your body looks like or what your spouse's body looks like sex is not just this physical act of two bodies coming together sex is really about two spirits and souls coming together and that mental emotional connection with your spouse so that's where I think it needs to start is women start desiring yourself not based on your external appearance which you can do you know you can make yourself look good and desire yourself that way but really desiring yourself internally first the next thing I want to say with regards to that is <clears throat> when you when your husband approaches you and says you look beautiful or I'd love to have sex with you tonight or whatever instead of dismissing it and taking it for granted is again it's mindset like you said is thinking okay this is one of the avenues that Allah is is showing me that he loves me that Allah loves me that Allah Allah gives us love in so many different ways so when your child just randomly comes and hugs you yes the child loves you but really who's the source of love is Allah al so this the, the love is coming from Allah through your child who's then hugging you the same applies to your husband now who where Allah is the source of love mm. and that love is coming through your husband to you are you gonna put a wall there and say no Allah I don't want your love I don't need your love so it's really reframing it that way is Allah is trying to show me love mm. <clears throat> and and seeing that desire from your spouse as provision from Allah that Allah Allah I don't want to say Allah desires you but Allah is noticing you and Allah wants you to be connected with your spouse and so don't shut that off it's open yourself up it's it really is about being in receptive mode and being in the receptive mode mode is a very feminine mode to be in is is not having to do 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 it's just yeah. being and yes. be willing to receive that yeah and I think that just as you said, it is receiving the risk. It's receiving this opportunity because that's, I think, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing is opening a door for you or there's, mm -hmm. there's a doorway that has been presented. And on the other side of that doorway is all the good stuff, right? It's the barakah, it's, you yeah. know, it's it's the reward, it's, uh, you know, the connection, it's the increased love and all the other good stuff that we talked about. And it's just a matter of, you know, are you going to take this opportunity? Are you going to, you know, push the door open and go in? Um, and like you said, the whole being willing to receive, even mm -hmm. the compliments, yeah, you know, even the compliments, even the hints, even the, the flirts, um, you know, those acts of love, those acts of service, being willing to receive, you know, and allow yourself to be filled up with that. I don't know. I'm just, I, as we're talking, I'm just imagining like a whole army of Muslim wives who are just connected to their femininity and connected to their sexual nature mm -hmm. i don't know man i think they'll be pretty happy and i think that their yeah. husbands will be pretty happy too and i, think I agree that would be a very good thing yes absolutely that's that's what we want that like we want that and i, I really feel like it will um inshallah change the like i think that unfortunately there is a lot of divorce happening within the Muslim community. Not that it's necessarily a bad thing. Divorce can be a good thing. But sometimes, you know, the reasons for those divorce perhaps could have been prevented mm. or could have been, you know, they, the, perhaps the couple just needed some therapy or some to work with a professional to heal some of the issues that they didn't realize could be healed. And so they kind of just thought this is too much. We just have to divorce where really perhaps the, those that man and woman in that couple were perfect for each other and meant to be for each other but they didn't see it and so you know like I said sex is not the only thing in marriage but it's a big part of marriage and sex unfortunately is quite a big cause of divorce uh, within yeah. the Muslim community and, and we want to prevent that you know if we're able to save a marriage for good reasons like if you know the man is a good man and the woman is a good man and they are good for each other 
And it is just about they didn't have education about sex or they didn't know how to overcome this sexual issue. And we can help them with that. That is amazing. And, and they will, you know, enjoy each other and and have a, a better, a better, mm. more strength in marriage, inshallah. Inshallah, Ya Rab, may Allah bless all of us in our homes and our relationships with our spouses and our sex mm -hmm. lives. Yes, I said it. Mm -hmm. Sis, how can people get in touch with you? The best way is to email me. Um, it's support at amirazaki.com. My name has a H at the end as well. Um, but, you know, I am on Instagram, but I don't accept messages at the moment. But on my Instagram is an email button. So that will take you to the email. I said really the best way is email. Um, and yeah, we can take it from there. I, I specifically work with women who experience painful sex or vaginismus. That is my main focus. But I equally do work with women who are struggling with their sex lives, you know, perhaps are not enjoying it or have certain sexual issues. So, you know, if those apply to you and you would like help, feel free to email me, inshallah. Excellent, mashallah. And those links will be in the description, guys. We'll put everything down there for you. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. If you did, please give the video a like, make sure you leave a comment and of course, subscribe to the channel and do follow Sister Amira on all her platforms. And if you do need her help, then definitely get in touch. Um, this is something, alhamdulillah, that is halal, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made halal for us, has put barakah in it for us. So why are we leaving halal good stuff? On the mm. table. No yeah. reason, right, Amira? Uh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Zakala khair and sis, it's been really, really special. Definitely we will see you again on the channel, inshallah. Wa iyaki sister. Thank you so much for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.